you know, you being who you are, you're very concerned about what's going on in the world today, and especially within the church. But, you know, I'm talking about that virtue of fortitude, that, that you know, that beautiful, beautiful gift of the Holy Spirit to regard. Alexa Laber. <laughs> to write this book because you're basically calling the leadership of the church out with regard to this decline in the number of Catholic couples or couples that are baptized Catholic getting married today. Well, I, I appreciate you uh, spending time with us. I appreciate you calling it what you're getting first. I, I would probably start by saying that there are some voices in the Catholic world right now who seem to enjoy calling out priests and bishops. For the record, I am not one of them. I, I don't like doing this. Um, but I will say that this particular thing needs to be done because, again, you know, you opened this, you know, the segment to me about um, the problems in marriage. It's really the way to start the discussion, I think, is by looking at a couple of data points. Okay. In the late 1960s, uh, there were th about 350 annulments per year. That's every diocese in America combined, 350 annulments. That's the late 60s. 20 years later, there were 70,000 annulments. So something pretty bad happened. 350 to 70,000. The second data point would be, if you go back to that same time frame, late 1960s, there were 400,000 Catholic weddings in America. But in the year 2020, we had fewer than 100,000 weddings in all of America, Catholic weddings. So you start looking at those numbers, and you, you can't be silent about it if you realize what's going on. And so that is what the impetus for you're writing this book and really ask the question, what's going on in there? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a good question to ask, and uh, you know, I'm glad that you did. How was it you first became aware of these, you know, as, as we call them, precipitously shrinking numbers? How, how, what alerted you to this in the first place? So there was a friend of mine that came to me maybe three or four years ago and was having problems with marriage and looked like it was, might be on the horizon for him. So he came to me for some help. He recognized me as a Catholic apologist. And he said, John, what I'm hearing some things in my diocese which don't make a lot of sense. And one of them was is that um, his diocese, and I found out this is true for every diocese that I know of, actually mandated that he get a civil divorce prior to even having the Nolan hearing. And my reaction to that was, that can't, he must have misunderstood. That, that can't be. And I researched it and figured out that actually that was the case. His diocese, and again, it's every diocese that I'm aware of, mandates civil divorce paperwork before they will even hear uh, to even discuss the validity of your marriage. That's a broken system. What, what, do, you, what do you see as broken about it? Well, I'd start with this. I would say that in America right now, um, there, there, so let me, I'll go into two reasons why they give. And this is something we talked about on the TV show. You would ask me, and I told you, no, I really can answer it. Because you asked a really good question. Why is it the more brighter? And, I, and I, uh, the answer is essentially, and I've actually spent a lot of time researching since then. So it was a great question. So essentially, the two, uh, there's a couple of answers that are given. One of them is, is, that, is that the diocese is claiming that they are worried um, about what, what's called in law alienation of affection. It's a term held over from common law, which basically is, is that if, uh, if if I did something, or if, let's say that I encouraged uh, a, a, a friend of mine to divorce her husband, he could theoretically sue me if she went on to get a divorce, because he, he could theoretically sue me as, as someone who really alienated, got her cause an alienation of affection for the spouse. Okay. That's I basically that. why I put them. Yeah, that's why I put the book. Typically, it's just used for, you know, for, adult, for an adulterer, basically. But here's what's interesting I found out about that. There are only six states, obviously out of 50 states in America, who even have alienation of affection on the book, which is obviously to say that. 44 states don't even have alienation of affection laws. So if anyone in the diocese, and that in a particular diocese, like I live in Florida, as you well know, so in here in Florida, there's no alienation of affection law. You can't be sued for it because it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So if dioceses are claiming they're all worried about alienation of affection, well, stop worrying. That's easy because, you know, as, as I say, in only six states, uh, so those exist. And within those, corporations and churches are 
remember it too. So it's a really, it's a really lousy answer. Does, does that make sense? It, it does. It makes perfect sense to me. And of course, you know, I, I think when we think about, you know, annulment, um, and, and we talked about annulment a lot on, on Women of Grace Live because we get all kinds of questions related to marriages and, and difficulties and struggles and, uh, you know, so this, this issue comes up often enough. So I think it would be good for us to talk a little bit about what an annulment is because many people believe that it's simply Catholic divorce. In other words, well, you know, you get a civil divorce and the church has her own way of, of doing divorce and it's called annulment. But, but that isn't what it is. I mean, and this goes back to the marriage covenant itself and, and what that means. So, you know, when we're unpacking this today and we're talking about, well, where, where, where has, has some of the leadership gone wrong and you're pointing out one very big way, I think, uh, then it begins to it begins to help us to understand that this can be corrected and it should be corrected and why it needs to be corrected. So let's talk a little bit about that reality of what what the marriage covenant is and what annulment is in light of that and why it's putting the cart before the horse to mandate that there be a civil divorce prior to even a hearing of whether or not there's a decree of nullity available. So absolutely. So um, annulment, is, first of all, I just say that annulment is not a great word. What we should be saying is a finding of nullity, or maybe even more descriptively, a discovery of nullity. Mm -hmm. So, okay. so uh, what would happen in that case would be that let's say that, uh, you know, there, 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 there are, by the way, there are valid reasons why people can get find why find annulment to happen. What changes up is, but essentially, annulment, a finding of nullity is going back essentially to the wedding day. So, when you were married, so Lisa, when Lisa and I were married, for instance, um, we were that was that was something happened on that day. The marriage was either valid right then or not. Nothing that happens later has any effect over that validity. The problem is, and that's a key thing, but the problem is, is that when you had uh, the divorce culture, which certainly came into vogue in the late 1960s, I probably, probably used to throw the flag up in terms of a cultural thing where it was sort of, you know, pretty, pretty widespread. What, what happened, the, the argument for the divorce was, for civil divorce, would be, well, I'm not happy anymore in my marriage, I want out. Well, effectively, that became the same argument for seeking a uh, decree of nullity. I'm not happy anymore. But the problem is, I mean, some marriages are, you know, much more happy than others. There are some, certainly a lot of troubled marriages out there. But they're still valid. My marriage, because, you know, I always say, look, I have a story about marriage. I've had a crush on Lisa since Regan was an author. So, yeah, so that's what I'm talking about, right? I have, I have a lovely marriage, right? What I like to read about. Mostly it's my wife's kids. You know? but, but, but the point is, is that God has blessed us, right? But my marriage is no more valid than someone who is in a marriage that is coupled. It's valid or not. But part of the problem was is that canon lawyers went rogue and basically started to argue that, well, they're not happy anymore, and they would start to look at things that happened afterwards. And then what they would justify it up is of going back and saying, well, back when you were married, were you influenced by you know this? Were you influenced by that? And how mature were you really? Well, I was 21. I and I would have gotten married, I knew I would have married at least when I was 17, I would have done it. I thought it was a good job, but I, you know, I go to college, but, but essentially, to, to your point, it, it, it was basically, it was people going in, wanting an annulment, and then it became, you know, getting a, getting a lawyer on your side, or a candidate lawyer on your side to represent you and get an annulment, and the, the, one of the greatest scandals surrounding this is not simply the number, but it's the fact that in many dioceses, 100% of people who file for annulment get an annulment. 100%. Well, that's, so, that's, that's, um, that's telling in and of itself, isn't it, though? Yes. Yes, it, it is. I mean, it, so if you, so in other words, if you go in, and, and, the, and the sad part is, well, there are many sad parts, but another sad part is, is that uh, I heard a statistic the other day that in terms of civil divorce, 70% 70 uh, 70 of civil divorces have, a, have one party that didn't want the divorce. 70%. So, so most of the time, this is not you know, a mutual thing. Right. And lest we forget, this is another scandal, and this is that, is 
disagree with you. Now, you know, I'm, I am old enough to remember when you had to have grounds for a divorce. You had to go before a judge. A judge would hear the case. A judge would make a decision. And that decision was binding as to whether or not you could get a divorce. Um, and so divorce in the United States of America, I can't speak for other countries because I'm not aware of what it was like then, I haven't done a study on it. Uh, but at least in the United States of America, of America divorce was a rare occasion. Now I grew up in, in a neighborhood, it was a blue collar neighborhood, grew up in this neighborhood. Um, it was primarily, I, I would say, it was, a, it, was a, it was a culturally mixed neighborhood in the sense that there were a lot of Protestants and a lot of Catholics there. I didn't know one couple, I didn't experience one child whose parents had divorced until I got to college. Now, th that's pretty remarkable, right? Uh, there was no one divorced in my neighborhood. No one in a separate marriage in my neighborhood. No mixed or blended families in my neighborhood. Um, there were none in my elementary school as a whole. There were none in my high school as a whole. I knew of none. Uh, and so when I went off to university and met someone whose parents were divorced and then subsequently met someone whose parents were getting a divorce, you know, I, I was horrified by the concept of it. Uh, and I know that that sounds so strange today, but you know, this is where we are today, where it's become so commonplace. I even heard uh, someone that I know quite well um, who uh, 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 provides services for brides at weddings. She's, she's a makeup artist. And she says she attended a wedding not long ago where the, the bride herself was already planning her second wedding. <laughs> She's getting married, getting makeup put on her face, but planning in her mind to divorce this guy and at some point in time to have another wedding. So, I mean, we've, we've, we've broken this, this, this whole beautiful reality of what God intends through this union of man and wife that he's elevated to the, 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 the altar and calls it sacrament. So I think that we need to talk a little bit about what marriage is to understand why this is so alarming. And then, of course, you know, what I, I want for us to do uh, to John is, is, is to talk about some remedies. But I want to give just, you know, uh, you know, some of those statistics that you were given because I've got these uh, based on a program that we did the last time. So as you said, um, this, this precipitous decline happened after the 1960s. Uh, in 1980, uh, it dropped from 426,000 in 1969 to 326, and in the year 2014, only 148,000 couples received the sacrament. And in 2020, the number, as you said, shrank to less than 100,000. And so this is this is not good news. It's not good news for society because marriage is the basic cell. A family is the, an intact family is the basic cell of society. Uh, and it's not good for the children, uh, who, who are the, the, the beautiful offspring of, of this union of husband and wife, uh, the, the ones who, who, who experience this. We know that divorce is not healthy for children. Uh, you can't make something healthy that's, that's already unhealthy. You can work with it, make it better, but there's always that, that longing in, in the heart of the child. Um, and this is not to castigate any of you listening today that, that might be divorced or might have procured an annulment, because as John is saying, there are reasons for it. It exists because there are reasons for it. What he's talking about here is the abuse and the infiltration of the cultural decline of the dignity of the coming together of husband and wife infecting the church like a cancer begins to infect a body. And here, it's the body of Christ. And we want to offer ways in which we can kind of stop this and, and come to a better resolution for those marriages that are struggling. So more with John Clark on the other side of the break. Stay with us. <laughs> Next time on EWTN Live. 
join Bear Wozniak as he encourages men to embrace strength and humility and embody a true Christ-like authentic masculinity. KWT Live with me, Father Patrick Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern on KWTN TV and radio. There are hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy and over 100 billion galaxies in our universe. When you think about that, it's easy to feel insignificant and small. But I think God is looking down from heaven saying, you're huge next to all this. Look, as big as the mountains are, can they make a choice? As big as an ocean is, can it love someone? As big as a galaxy is, can it change directions? No, but you can. More than anything in creation, you're the mirror image of God. You have a soul. You have an intellect and will. You can know, make decisions, give and receive love. And ultimately, you're made to share in the love of God forever. You stand apart from everything, and you'll still be around long after all this has passed. Sure, you're physically small in this universe, but when you think about the ways that you and all people stand out from the rest of creation, you're kind of a big deal. <laughs> this is Chris Stefani from reallifecatholic.com. Journey deeper in your understanding of the Eucharistic mystery and the Eucharistic story of God's love for us. Download the free ebook, The Twelve Stations of the Most Holy Eucharist, at EWTN.com slash Catholicism. Hi, this is Cy Keller later today on Catholic Answers Live. We've got Trent Horn for Open Forum. Join us, Catholic Answers Live, 6 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Now, back to Women's Radio. Welcome back, friends. You're listening to Women of Grace Live. I'm Johnette Williams. Happy as a clam to be with you today. I am happy to be with you Monday through Friday at this same time on this same station, discussing issues of importance to your life and your faith. Uh, we're discussing a big topic today, and because it's such a big topic, we're not taking any calls and we're not using social media. So uh, I, I just really want you to listen up. We're talking about a really hard topic today because it's one I know that stings. Um, sometimes to hear these kinds of, of, of discussions. And yet I think that it's really important. Uh, you know, it's sort of like when, when you have a wound, you know, you've got this wound and it's gaping and it needs to be cleaned. And you know it is really going to hurt. It's going to really, really hurt uh, when that, you know, that antiseptic is applied to that wound. But you know if the wound is going to heal, then you have to apply the antiseptic, right? So... Um, you know, so this, uh, uh, here's my big old disclaimer here. Uh, we're not talking about individual ca cases here. We're not talking about you. Uh, we're not talking about anything um, other than the topic itself and the need for a recognition of a, a malady, really, that, that's, that's happening within the context of society as a whole, but has also begun to impact the church. And here we're talking about the decline of marriages in the church. And we know that there are cultural influences for that. When I bring our guests back on, maybe we'll talk about some of those. Uh, but uh, John has written a book. His name is John Clark. I've known John for, I don't know, maybe 20 years. It's got to be at least that long. Uh, he is uh, a husband, a father. He's a columnist. He's a speech writer. He's a blogger. Above all, he's a faithful Catholic. He loves his faith. Uh, he is very attuned to cultural trends because of what it is that you've done. And he's attuned to cultural trends uh, within and outside of the Catholic Church, right? And it's important to look at both of them because both have a huge impact on our society. Now, he's written a book. I interviewed him on television. I told you about that uh, at the beginning of the show. I interviewed him on this book on television, and you can watch those programs by going out to womenofgrace.com, clicking on TV, putting John's name in, John Clark, C-L-A-R-K, uh, into the search engine, and the shows will come up, and you can watch them. I think that you should. Uh, but I wanted to have him on radio, too, because the topic is so important. His book is great, Betrayed Without a Kiss. I mean, not what a captivating title, but that's why he is a columnist, a speechwriter, a blogger, <laughs> you know, a book writer, and all of these things. An author, Betrayed Without a Kiss, here is the, 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 uh, the equally uh, enticing sub, uh, subtitle, Defending Marriage After Years of Failed Leadership in the Church. Prior to our break, we were talking about the issue of annulment, which is a big annulment, a, a big issue, rather. And um, so we wanted to come back. I want to come back to that because, you know, you were sharing with us, and I think that we were talking um, around some of the realities. And, and one of the things that you said, 
uh, John, is that you know a, 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 a finding or a discovery of nullity, which is really good language, null meaning no, <laughs> void, right? A discovery of that uh, is it has nothing to do with what happens after the marriage. So adultery, it wouldn't be wouldn't be looked at as as validating an annulment, right? I fell out of love is not valid. Um, I'm not happy anymore isn't valid. Uh, my house, or, uh, my husband or my wife is a louse is not valid. It's unfortunate, and and things need to be done about that. But it's not the dissolution of the marriage, uh, because the uh, 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 finding or a discovery of nullity goes back to the moment of marriage. So let's just talk with the mind and the heart of the church for a moment about what marriage is. What is marriage? So, so I think that what, when the encyclopedia question, and I think it, I think it took a book as opposed to a blog to answer this question. So what I did was to answer this question, I went back all the way back, and as you both know, my it starts off in the Garden of Eden in the very beginning. So what what happens? And so if we really want to understand the the sacrament of matrimony, we need to understand the start of the discussion that sacraments are restorative in nature. So in other words. Jesus re, uh, uh, elevated matrimony to a sacrament. So to understand what was intended originally by God in the Lutheran Garden, and what do we find? We find that uh, marriage is enjoyable from the beginning. That's very clear. We learn that children are primary from the beginning. And again, I'll say it here because it's not set up in churches. The primary purpose of marriage is the procreation and education of children. There are secondary ends, but the primary purpose is that. And if you want to know, sometimes I think people think the church sort of pulls things out of hats, right? Well, you know, why, why is the church talking about that? Where, where is that in scripture? Well, it really couldn't be clearer because it's God's first command to man, right? Be fruitful and multiply. But beyond that, we see something that's very intriguing also is that it's not just the procreation, which would be be fruitful and multiply. It's the education, but we might say we might say yeah. upbringing. Because this education from the Latin is a more comprehensive word than we get in English, but it would be more upbringing. So we really need to focus on that. And one of the ways that really drives home, it really emphasizes how important marriage is in the Old Testament is by looking at the New Testament. So at the end of the Old Testament. The devil comes, the serpent comes and uh, attempts a marriage to attempt a uh, marriage. And so essentially, the devil, his first move is to break up a marriage. He's tempting the couple together. And so, yeah, so again, what you have is, is that the, the book of Genesis and that, and the, uh, uh, and that section ends in tragedy. But I do find one thing really interesting, and I really want to emphasize this in the book. That as tumultuous as Adam and Eve's marriage was, and creation fell, they started not that. And yet, Adam and Eve never considered divorce. I don't, and I say, I don't think they ever forgot how good marriage could be. So we look at that, and then we go to open the, the, the Gospel of John. As we go to the wedding feast of Cana, an incredible thing happens. Mary says they have no one. You know, a quick reading might simply mean Mary just noticing, like, they don't have any wine, or it's just, it's just like they don't have any cake, there's something wrong, you know, this is embarrassing for a couple. Mary knew very well that when she said that, she was essentially um, beginning the, the road, Jesus, Jesus' road to Calvary. Because she was suggesting, or, you know, telling him, this, 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 you know, by saying there's no wine, it was a way of saying, this is the time for your public ministry to begin at a wedding. And so to affirm that, so how important is marriage to God? Incredibly important. How important is marriage to Mary? Incredibly important. And we need to start looking back at these and throughout the book in terms of answering the question, what is marriage? There, there's a lot there and I'm hoping that priests will pick this up and start talking about the beauty of marriage. You made a good point earlier in, uh, in the last segment. You talked about how you didn't know anybody that was divorced growing up. But I'd be willing to guess that in that same time frame, priests talked about the fact that God hates divorce. Now, 
sometimes you don't want to talk to them. Fucking mouth tied you. They, they, they don't talk. They don't talk to that. So we need to look at all this. We need to look at the fact that, that God loves marriage and emphasize that from the pulpit. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. I, there's there's so many thoughts going through my mind. I've got some comments um, more than, than, than a question right now. But, you know, um, it, it, it's an, there, there is that saying, you know, don't let the camel get its nose under the tent because pretty soon the tent collapses. And unfortunately, in the late 60s, what did happen is the camel got its nose under the tent. And so we're seeing the collapsing of a lot uh, that, that has taken place uh, through these intervening 50 years, uh, but continuing to take place. Um, and, and we've got to get the camel out of the tent, which means we've got to let the, we've got to get the infectious notion of a culture that has gone mad, a culture that is infatuated with deception, um, a culture that is infatuated with darkness. We've got to get that out of the out of the tent. We've got to get it out. Um, now, how we get it out? That's another question. Uh, but but that's that's part of this issue. And I think that we've said that already when we talked about the fact that you know in 1973 was when no fault divorce. Um, was was it became the law of the land, and it was also the same year that that Roe v. Wade was passed. So you put those two together, and you begin to see that that was a year of victory uh, for for the divine. I mean, it was a year of victory. Uh, so that being said, though, I love the the use of the term, uh, you know, because this was something that I read in your book that I had never thought about, and I spent a lot of time in the garden uh, because I just I truly love uh, the first three three chapters of Genesis are are probably my three favorite. Um, and I spent a whole lot of time there, and I never thought about the fact, even though it, you know, really, it's kind of once you say it, it's like, oh my gosh, you that's the case. You know, Adam was alone, right? He didn't know really who he was. So God says it's not good for the man to be alone. He takes the rib out of his side, he forms the woman, and at last, this is bone my bone and flesh my flesh. The 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 the, the, the use of the, the term that you use that that I see is restorative. You know, it's restorative. Um, in other words, it restores Adam Great. to a full notion of who he is. He, yes. he, he, the, the, it's, it, 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 it in some way it makes him whole, right? It makes him mm-hmm. whole. And I think it's in your book you talk about, it, yes, and, 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 you know, there was one, and then there were two, and then they were one again, right? Um, it, it, you, you say that, and, and, and it's, you know, you have to think about that. You know, there was one. The, the, the woman comes from the side of man, there were two, and then through the, the, the uh, beautiful uh, uh, marital act, they become one again, and that becomes a fruitful action, you know, that, 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 that is, is proof of the beauty of that union. And, uh, you know, and, and is not only restorative, but replicative. <laughs> you know, that love replicates itself, if you will, uh, in, in, in another human person, and it all begins again, um, and that's beautiful. The other thing that I think is so lovely about what you said here, and I mean lovely in, in terms of, of uh, intellectual consideration, is the fact that uh, you talk about the fact, and I never really thought about this. <laughs> you know, I don't know what Adam was doing. He was sleeping on the job. I don't know what he was doing, <laughs> but, but he wasn't paying much attention. But but what's this? The you know, they're always together up to the point where the evil one lures Eve away from her husband, away from the protective custody of her husband. You know? and, and, and so he separates them and attacks one. And this really kind of pertains, doesn't it, to what you said about 70% of annulment cases in the United States, there is one of the parties that does not want the annulment. In other words, he separates, he divides, uh, and usually it's one party in that marriage that is lured away in some fashion. Um, a third notion is is when, that, that I was thinking about, was when you said that, you know, the, 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 the primary good of marriage, what is marriage ordered to? Marriage is ordered to the procreation of children. That's what it's ordered towards, the procreation, be fruitful, multiply. You know, it, that is the first commandment. And it, that's why it's sad when a couple wants to have children and is not able to conceive, right? It's regrettable, right? Um, 
so the fact of the matter is, you know, this 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 idea of the replication of children um, is what marriage is ordered to. We've got this false notion in our mind that it's ordered for my happiness. <laughs> it's ordered for my satisfaction, right? It's not ordered to that. And this brings us to the other elephant in the room that we have to talk about. And like I said, this this such an involved topic, but it's such a good one. We wouldn't have annulments and people looking for annulments. We wouldn't have divorces. Here I'm talking specifically about Catholic couples. We wouldn't have divorces if we had good right. marriage preparation, and we don't. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I, as I mentioned in the book, we talk about, John Paul II talks about uh, the stages of uh, what we would call pre canon here in America, right? So you have the box and the stage, you've got the, but in America, part of the problem is is that, well, first of all, some of these pre cana uh, marriage prep is disastrous. Um, couples get together and exchange ideas for what, they, what they're using for contraception. It's just a disaster. But the other problem is, is that if you want, there was an idea uh, a couple of years ago that uh, the church takes 16 months to do marriage prep. Well, that means that violates natural law. The couple has a natural law right to marry, and 16 months is far too long. But if the idea is, that we want to make sure that couples know their faith, I'm all for it. So here's my idea. Start speaking about marriage from the pulpit to everyone in church. What, what, in other words, why am I waiting, till, like I was married at 20 months, so let's say uh, I don't hear anything about marriage from the pulpit until I'm engaged and ready to get married, and I'm getting married in six months. I don't really know anything about my faith at all. That's a really bad system. So, what it should be is that you should talk about marriage at least five or six times a year from the pulpit. Talk about it. Um, we're not hearing enough from the pulpit. That's the primary problem. I mean, I'm happy to write this book. I want to get this message out. But at the end of the day, if, if this is the result in speaking about the good and the goods of marriage, the beauty of marriage, God's design for marriage, 